Um, so Hello. good evening. Hello. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to um, welcome everyone to this evening's Berlaga keynote lecture uh, by Anna Pujaner, where she will present her research on kitchenless cities. Um, it's a pleasure to have Anna here um, via New York um, as a lecture that complements um, uh, the two week masterclass entitled A Journey Around My Room, which is being led by Becca and Lemois. So when, um, well, Becca and Lemois had given a keynote lecture um, earlier um, in our academic year and usually under, um, uh, well, when a masterclass comes, we invite the masters um, to give this uh, keynote during the, the fourth night. But since they had recently spoken already, we uh, extended the invitation to somebody else. And uh, we uh, basically came uh, with the suggestion to invite Anna to complement some of the thinking that, has, um, that she has been working on, which is complementary uh, to the work of Beck and Lemois, and in particular, the theme of this master um, class. Um, Anna um, uh, is a uh, architect, editor, research, and co-founder of the architectural office, uh, MAIO. Um, and, um, uh, well, at any rate, it's a pleasure to have her here uh, to give, I think this is our uh, sixth, no, fifth keynote of the semester, which uh, is an ongoing lecture series featuring internationally prominent architects, designers, and thinkers who are at the forefront of design discourse and innovation. Um, well, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you also on uh, Ella and Louise and our students. So thank you, uh, Anna, and we look forward to this evening's talk and we give the screen to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. First, um, obviously I have been following uh, the Berlari for a long, long time. Uh, then I'm a big fan of Becca Lemoine, so it's fantastic to meet them and share uh, some time also because I have uh, good friends um, in, here in the, in the in the audience so I'm, I'm very happy to to be able to talk uh, with you today and uh, yeah Didi, I'm, I'm gonna I, I bring a lot today so I'm gonna talk a little bit about everything a little bit about a, a theoretical framework a little bit about um, um, obviously, a kitchenless city. Um, a little bit about the office work, how that relates to all this theoretical thinking, and at the end, shortly, what I'm dealing and working with um, that um, I have heard that the school is working on uh, Mexico City. So I will I will relate a little bit the research with Mexico City as as well, um, and then I will be happy to. Um, um, open the conversation and maybe we can discuss further certain things. Um, um, so I have been working on this um, idea of the kitchenless city or living without the kitchen for a while. And basically for me, it's, um, it's more than a proposal, it's um, a provocation to start a conversation. And since I start unveiling uh, kitchenless buildings and and urban kitchens, is that I start receiving this kind of emails that obviously are not uh, nice and 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 sweet emails, but totally the opposite. And this type of reaction, the reaction against getting rid of the kitchen, allows us to understand the deep affections that we nowadays do have in relation with this domestic piece and not others. I always push my students to reflect on the fact that we are willing to get rid of the living room or we are willing to get rid of the bedroom, but the kitchen is something much more emotional. And I basically use this provocation to start a conversation in order to understand where these values uh, come from and why, and the need of dismantling the modern house as we know it. We know that housing has been a tool uh, for the political construction of capitalism. We know that housing um, has been very efficient on defining um, social structures. 
based on um, bias relations, um, on bias uh, uh, relations based on gender, age, and race. And uh, ultimately, uh, this um, um, Procedures of architectural exclusion have been used in order to reinforce the heteropatriarchal um, 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 social structure and denied other social realities, um, um, gender constructions, uh, sexual relations, family structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, in order to explain a little bit this where this conflict comes from and why I do think that we need to dismantle the modern house as we know it. And among other things, we need to dismantle through redefining how we understand care and the reproductive labor is precisely because the house cannot be detached or as we understand the home cannot be detached with the idea of labor, both productive and reproductive labor. Uh, so in other words, that labor that happens outside the home and it's regulated is uh, considered part of the industrial procedure and the labor that supports that production that always has been um, enclosed with the, the idea of the domestic sphere. And this uh, dichotomy between these two labors, as Silvia Federici uh, explains us, among others, uh, uh, theorists and academics, we know that this dichotomy emerged uh, in, at the uh, beginning of capitalism, in a mo moment, um, the, what we could uh, call the proto-capitalism, in which, um, for the first time, the idea of which was invented and progressively and uh, the labor and the body started to be detached from the land. It started to be detached from a particular territory and started to be uh, internationally, um, interterritorial. Progressively, and we know that because if you take a look to feudal times and you, in particular, to, 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 and to try to, to um, depict domestic scene in feudal times, we realized that at that moment, um, all kinds of, 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 of types of work were mixed, but also all kinds of bodies were mixed. And the distinction between labor types and in relation with the space types was not that clear. So it was precisely with the merge of capitalists that this distinction started. And with that distinction started also a division based on bodies. So the, man, the, the, man, um, the male body was understood as a body uh, to perform the productive labor. Meanwhile, the female body was understood as a body to perform the reproductive labor. So progressively, the house started to be a tool um, to define this division of labors and to define these exclusions and reclusions. And progressively, as we know it, the house was related with the female body. And uh, what is interesting, and that's why I think it's so important once again to talk about this conflictive division is precisely because every time that we have had an industrial revolution, started from the first one, this, this, this clear distinction, this clear dichotomy has a struggle. And as we know, as we, know we are in, deep, in a deep industrial revolution based on the digital, right, and internet. Um, but let me trace back, with the, why did that happen? With the first industrial revolution, it was the first moment that uh, women enter into industrial labor. It was the first crisis that um, um, put on the table this, uh, um, the conflict of, uh, managing both labors, the one at home and the one outside home. And that crisis was um, grew enormously with the second industrial revolution when it was at that time that um, women entered completely into industrial labor. And we see precisely at that moment when the house needed to be redefined, reinvented in order to allow this conflict to be solved. And it was through, by the means of the, uh, in, the introduction of appliances, 
but also the introduction of what we could call efficiency within the home through design, um, that the house started to be understood as a machine that would solve, thanks to good architecture and proper design, would solve the reproductive labor, the domestic labor, to the point that it was uh, communicated and uh, suddenly this, oh, this whole imaginarium of work that could be done even um, magically started to be emerged, uh, started to emerge. So suddenly domestic uh, work was easy, had this kind of happy flavor and, and, um, and all these uh, techniques and architectures were understood in order to cut down um, hours, hours of work and labor. But we know at this point that all that was just as mentioned as in an imaginary that didn't correspond to the actual reality. And we know looking to social studies that the amount of time that do we, that do we, that, they, that we dedicate at home to domestic labor nowadays is actually precisely the same one at that time, even though we do have better uh, uh, home devices and et cetera. And that, um, um, the relation with uh, uh, each, um, um, so the, this crisis of labor in each of the technological changes can be again easily uh, understood looking to the third industrial revolution, the industrial revolution related to media, um, a revolution that happened precisely after the Second World War, in which many, ter in which in many territories, in, and in particular in the United States, there was the need to regulate labor in order to accommodate the post-war reality. And in the, in the US, for instance, um, in order to regulate labor, there was the will uh, from the government to uh, um, um, define certain policies to reinforce the role of women at home and to understand their, um, um, their presence at home as an important social role. And it was precisely through the use of t the TV that this image of uh, the, you know, the perfect uh, house housewife uh, that was the head of this heteropatriarchal family within the home uh, and the kitchen as a core alongside the TV uh, started to emerge. Um, and it's very interesting to um, uh, reading Paul B. Preciado, it's very interesting to understand the relations between that time and the actual time. So at that time, obviously this heteropatriarchal family was deeply reinforced, the idea of the single house, the idea of particular domesticity, the idea of women that would work just at home, etc. cetera. Um, but at that time, it was already the moment that the houses started to be connected with territories be beyond the limit of the house itself. So the idea of hyperconnectivity alongside the idea of working from home, but not only domestic work started to emerge. And as Pre Paul Me Preciado um, mentions, it was a time that can be mirrored with the, our actual times. In which the private started to be open to the public. And so therefore it was started to be transgressed, but also the programs that the modern movement established. So what uh, was uh, accepted and understood at, uh, in modernity, spaces to live and spaces to work, started to be transgressed. And that's precisely what we're living nowadays, that we work from home, but also we live at work <laughs> and, and vice versa. And uh, the way labor and precisely domestic labor is being performed once again is in deep crisis. And we can talk about it afterwards. But, um, you know, the, 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 the impact of the share economy, the impact of, of, the, um, of, of the growth of, of delivery, and the precarity of many of, of the companies that basically the precarity of the type of labor that is being defined, um, and the extractivist processes that consequentially were um, um, Seen. And uh, so definitely it's a moment uh, that we need to talk once again about um, uh, reproductive labor and how our house um, answers to uh, the actual crisis. Um, but let me 
go back also to understand why I started talking about kitchenless city. Um, at the time, I started to research about collective kitchens and kitchenless um, houses um, in the 2006, 2007. At the time we were um, um, and in Spain, uh, we were in a moment pre-crisis with a huge boom of housing construction. And at that time, it was already evident um, that our market, our housing market was just defined by one typology uh, that we call it the key typology. So a typology that is composed by, you know, a huge head, which is defined by a living room, then a corridor, and then a set of smaller rooms, which define the hierarchy of the family. So at the end, the parents, and then a smaller um, the hierarchy of a nuclear family, and then uh, two other smaller rooms for the kids. Um, and at that time, we knew that our Spanish society, which was way much diverse to the point that just 28% of our uh, social structures could be defined under the umbrella of what we could name the traditional nuclear, nuclear family. And our family structures already at the time, before the economical crisis, were way much complex. So we were uh, claiming that our houses needed to understand that they should be way much more diverse with odd keys formulations. And so the research just started with a, with a critical position towards how housing was uh, being built um, in, 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 my in my territory. And obviously alongside um, that anger towards how architects were being build, were uh, building houses. Um, I was reading. I, I I was asked to translate the Grand Domestic Revolution from English to Spanish, and um, and uh, and I was acquainted with uh, Dolores Hayden work, and I was acquainted with um, the uh, all this uh, how she call it the material feminist movement as she call it and for me what it was very surprising um, reading um, and and you know Dolores Hayden um, it was precisely that the chapters of the book are organized based on women females this is a book that it was published in 1981. And it would, it's a book that is deeply rooted with feminist movements of that time. So there was the wish to um, reinforce the figure of this activist, this feminist activist of the 19th century in relation with um, this uh, incredible, uh, interesting uh, housing type policies, which would claim to re reinvent how the reproductive labor was being performed precisely, as I mentioned, in the middle of these two uh, um, 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 industrial revolutions. My interest um, started to emerge precisely in those, um, as, as the Rida mentions, right? It's sometimes it's more interesting what you leave of what, what you don't look at than what you look at. So I realized that Doris Hayden was very interested on those uh, female figures, but she was kind of neglecting um, other cases. So I started to, uh, in, uh, to, to research of those other cases, precisely what uh, what at that time in the 19th century were called apartment hotels in, New, in, 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 in the United States, which actually lack of any ideological movement that behind. They were purely commercial cases and ultimately therefore they were purely related with the capitalist um, um, society that was emerging very strongly at the time um, growing very strongly at the time in, in the United States. Also, as you know, there's a chapter in the, the Louis New York that is actually dedicated to the world of Astoria. And, uh, and the world of Astoria is one of those apartment hotels that Dolores Hyde uh, neglects in the book. I was quite curious then to understand how the world of Astoria as the other cases could emerge. And I said, at the beginning, I, I thought that I was gonna work just in, about this building. But then when I started tracing the relation between this building with possible others, I realized that there were hundreds of them just in Manhattan at the time. And, um, and I, I'm sure that there were many more. I just stopped counting and researching for the sake of my um, mind. Um, so, 
I pull trace back the origin of this typology to understand how it emerged and why it ended. You have to um, um, go back to the 19th century, precisely the moment after the Civil War. Uh, we are in um, 1860, 1865. The war finishes in 65, and there's a huge migration uh, towards the cities alongside, as you can imagine, a huge economical crisis and obviously a social one. And there was the need of housing in the cities. At the time, uh, the only uh, collective housing typology that uh, exists in the US, they were the so-called tenements. They were um, apartment houses defined by just one room no bathroom, no kitchen, and within that room, many families used to live. And it was a typology already at the time that was considered that it should be a race, um, a race because of um, overpopulation, but also a race because of lack of um, infrastructure, etc. So there was the need to invent new housing typologies, new, new collective housing typologies for this uh, growing uh, citizen. Um, uh, growing population in, 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 in many cities, but in particular in New York. And at that time, um, there was the need to invent what they wanted to, you know, kind of um, an identity through housing, a US identity that would represent this new uh, country after the war. And at that time, there was, um, it, it was there was a tradition quite rooted in the US of living in hotels. Hotels in the 19th century in the US were way different than hotels in Europe. Hotels in the US emerged thanks to the railroad and they emerged as soon as each of the cities and the smaller ones precisely and towns were connected with the railroad in order to have a public house. It was a house that operated as a city council, so as a public space. And at the same time, it was a house that would represent this new modern industrial city. Um, and from the beginning, it was precisely in those infrastructures where the most ultimate luxurious domestic um, inventions would be installed way before the richest houses. So the first um, um, running water system was installed in a hotel. The first toilets were installed in hotels, as well as heating, cooling system, etc. And very, very soon after the their emerge of the typology, they became, therefore, places to live in a permanent manner for those um, that were quite, the, for the wealthy part of the society. So it was a typo living in hotels, it was a typology that was of desire. And with this tradition, they, uh, when, when they needed to invent a new collective housing typology, they did kind of a mix between this hotel tradition, this hotel living tradition with the influence of their apartments in Europe. Obviously I'm, I'm referring to uh, the Parisian apartments and the Hausmannian Parisian apartments. And as you see, um, uh, the, uh, the, the previous one was the first one that emerged. At the time, the apartments had kitchens and a collective kitchen was placed in the bath, in the basement. But right after the kitchens were, were uh, erased from the apartments and, uh, and, and the grow, it, it, the, number, the number of, of them grew enormously. At the beginning already, um, in the first years already, these, the collective kitchen and the collective dining room started to be open to the public and it got professionalized. So uh, if you, yeah, it was, an, uh, the, the, the workers were um, professionalized basically and um, they started to open these collective infrastructures to the public also in order to uh, assure an, uh, a profitable economy, um, a better profitable economy. And we know that this type was desirable for a large um, social spectrum because uh, types of look into the types of rents but also types of floor plans we can find very small ones like this one with a parlor a bedroom and a bathroom to extremely large and luxurious ones and um, in this floor plan you can depict two apartments no kitchens but you know rooms for even servants and ser uh, private uh, domestic service etc um, so which allows us to understand that it was not only an economical reason that 
turn this um, typology so successful, but also a reason related with comfort. Um, one of the interesting things about this time um, that, um, that it's good to understand is how come they could live without a kitchen. And you have to understand that at the time. So what we consider comfortable and not comfortable, we consider good or bad in housing is a cultural construction. So it changed through time. And at the time it was, for instance, unacceptable to sleep at the same level of the public rooms by that the living room the parlor at the time, as it was called. So in this kind of hierarchy of, of, of distinction through levels, every program, every domestic program needed to be in different heights. And obviously the kitchen needed to be as far as possible to the living, to the parlor. So when the collective housing emerged, one of the things that was, you know, easy to accept was to share the kitchens in order not to have it at the same level of in the apartment. And what is interesting, and I would totally recommend if you haven't read Dolores Hayden, please do, because what is interesting is to see how this commercial um, um, uh, uh, proposals uh, emerge alongside um, um, proposals that were deeply rooted with um, um, the movements that uh, Robert Owen, but also the influence of other uh, social utopists and philosophers as Charles Fourier, um, uh, Saint-Simon, etc. The influence of that thinking in the US was extremely strong. And it's interesting to see how these communities that emerge at the beginning of the 19th century as, you know, um, isolated communities started to um, uh, invite uh, the imaginarium and the, the, the emerge of, of different uh, urban proposals in the second part of the 19th century, as well as influence the material feminist as, as I was referring before. And it's interesting to see how all this happened at the same time. And it's very, obviously, we can imagine that they, they knew among, um, among them. So one thing influenced the other and vice versa. Um, if you take a look to the collective houses of, of um, on the, the kitchenless houses of New York at the time, we see that they grew along as the city grew. So there were a lot, um, a lot of them emerged at the end of the 19th century alongside Upper West Side, in an Upper West Side, alongside the emerge of, of, the, of the, the public transport alongside the 9th Avenue. And at the time, um, in this area, in the Upper West Side, there were larger lots. So we can see how this typology grew in size. And, and also at the time, Central Park was consolidated. So for the first time, and it was, I'm, I'm always clarifying this, it's not due to the elevator that the floors above were of desire, it's due to the fact that for the first time there was a view. The rivers of that time, they were very dirty, not, not considered a place to look at. But the park defined a view. And, and the idea of the view turned the higher floors desirable. And it's important to see why that suddenly all these collective spaces started to happen in rooftops way before Le Corbusier, Toi Jardin. And, uh, and all this, um, um, collective kitchens, but also restaurants and, and uh, collective um, leisure spaces uh, did occupy these uh, very valued floors, which means that the collective infrastructure was, was of value. They became, you know, the squares, the public spaces, the spaces to socialize and to be. And what is interesting also about this time is that flexibility started to be something of desire. And uh, so tracing back to the, uh, to the um, story of hotel living, it was precisely at that time that suddenly um, the apartments started to, to use, uh, so rooms started to have more doors than um, needed in order to connect rooms as you do in an hotel or apartments in a way that suddenly the apartments could be expanded or decreased depending on the demand. And it was precisely at that time also that the rents started to be flexible. So you would pay depending on which kind of services you would use, like if you would eat there or not, if you would use the laundry or not. 
uh, but also you would pay depending on the size of your apartment. So the rents started to be flexible. And it's, it's very interesting how that had an impact on the apartment typology. We have buildings then that combine kitchenless with kitchen apartments, but also uh, keeping, you, you, hear, you see here a huge, enormous apartment um, next to a very tiny one, one with kitchen, the other one without kitchen. And you can see still that these rooms remain. So rooms that had two doors and allow this uh, kind of a small apartment to be rented by itself or connected to the, to the one next to it. And what is interesting when I map them is to see the change of numbers when um, we shift of century, with the shift of century. And that happened because in 1901, a housing uh, law emerged that regulated the tenement housing houses, but left out of the scope this kitchenless typology. And suddenly it was much more profitable to live, uh, to build kitchenless uh, apartment, apartments buildings. And therefore the developers uh, will wish to, to there, there was a wish for the developers for that typology, but also the rents were extremely uh, competitive. And uh, so at, after 1901, it was almost the same rent to rent, uh, the same amount of money to rent a kitchen apartment or a kitchenless apartment, but consider that within the kitchenless apartment, you would include, that would include all the services. That means food, but also even childcare, healthcare, et cetera. So it was extremely economical. And also what it's interesting is that at this time, this little, suddenly the people start to have the wish to, the citizens, the residents start to have, to have the wish to cook once in a while in their apartments. And all these kind of kitchen devices emerge. And uh, progressively, these kitchen devices that allow to cook, to have a light cooking within the apartment started to be commercialized by furniture companies as the, the Morphe bed, uh, as the Morphe bed company, you know, the, the folding bed company and many others. So the compact kitchen way emerged in the US way before the Frankfurt kitchen or the modern kitchen as we know it. And it emerged to occupy a small space, a former cupboard or a hook or a nook. Never, uh, the modern, the compact kitchen was never understood as a labor saving device at, as it became. And for me, it's very interesting so you, you, to see how this compact kitchen, to realize that this compact kitchen was always designed in relation with a collective kitchen, never by itself. And we can, uh, I tell that look into the floor plans because the fridge has two doors, one that connects to the collective um, corridor and the other one to the apartment in order to allow this um, interchange of goods and food to be done without uh, the person um, staying, the, the resident being at home. Um, and what is interesting is to see how this compact kitchen um, change its meaning during the first decade of the 20th century from something that was designed as a space labor this, um, device to something that was designed in order to cook faster, in order to reduce uh, domestic labor hours, right? Um, and that happened due to the emerge of the domestic engineer movement and the, to the emerge of this uh, progressive scientist, um, scientist applied to the home um, and uh, and this basically uh, was one of the reasons of the decay of the typology. Um, to change a, a, a whole way of living, you need not just one reason. So there was the, the merge of, of this mentality uh, in relation with uh, uh, efficiency and reproductive labor. There was the, um, the growth of... Um, the so-called red scar movement, which was actually a movement against anything that would look like communist. And that would happen precisely because the Soviets copied the typology and ideology uh, and turned it ideological. So suddenly it became something related with communist and related with um, the Soviets. And therefore in the States, there was Consequentially, anything that was collective started to be misunderstood. 
Um, on the top of that, you have a change of law in 1929 because the Odell lobby started to be very jealous of the fact that um, these infrastructures would rent rooms independently once in a while. So the Odell lobby, as we have nowadays again to Airbnb, right? The Odell lobby started to put a lot of pressure to, in order to change the law and regulate this uh, housing day policy that ultimately it was a law that it was very difficult to make them profitable. Um, and then obviously you have the, 20, the 1929 economical crash. So you have many reasons for this uh, way of living to disappear afterwards. What it remains from that time. So it remains a lot of habits here in the US. For instance, we share um, you know, the laundry easily, washing machines um, and many other convenience. And uh, what is left, so to consider women's collectivity and to be aware of its ideological component. And for me, what it's left is also the need to think that there were things of that time that need to be considered from our contemporary needs. I run a practice, as Salomon has mentioned, uh, called Mayo in Barcelona. And years ago, we won a competition, a private competition to build a housing block in, in, in the city. For those of, new, of you that you don't know, the city of Barcelona is defined by this homogeneous grid uh, um, that we, we have been always in love with because despite its homogeneity, it has a lot of heterogeneity within. Despite its order, it has a lot of disorder within. And we have been always fascinated by the fact that the neighborhood has changed through time enormously from housing to office and back to housing without changing its physiognomy that much. And that's obviously extremely sustainable. So with light changes, it's able to change and adapt to social, to the change in social needs. And we were willing to define a housing block that would have the same type of resiliency. And we came up with the need to define a type of a space that would allow any domestic program to happen. So not to predetermine what would happen within those rooms. And ultimately we come up with 110 rooms that that were arranged in a manner that would allow that to happen to the point that the kitchen can be even also played in any room. Um, and as it happened in the San Remo, these rooms can connect and disconnect to a large and decrease. So there's this will of uh, to achieve some sort of abstraction in order to allow the changes of family structures with through uh, allowing performability of the domestic program. So any kind of bedroom, so the bedrooms can be placed anywhere, the living room can be placed anywhere, it depends on how you live and which is your family structure. But also we started to think about why houses do need to have always the same physical limit. Can not they, why we cannot imagine a type that can low and decrease in order to change, to adapt also to the changing needs, which might be needs of space, but also economical needs. Um, well, the comparison is very obvious. So uh, where uh, Kitsila City remains, so for me it remains also in this kind of permanent reference that can be of interest from our contemporary perspective. And in order to do that, you know that laws always limit typologies. Uh, for good, because they want to assure um, that um, there's not an extractive uh, character or abuse, but also for bad, because in Spain, our housing typology actually pushes you to define this heteropatriarchal <laughs> housing typology of the key form, as I was referring before. And we uh, made a lot of effort to find loopholes in order to, legally speaking, be also ambiguous. So that's why we could achieve that all rooms could be all any kind of program, but also legally speaking. And the loophole is the door. That's why we always use double doors and very large doors, not only because of flexibility, but also for legal reasons. And I'm not going to go too much into this, but you know, there's always the need of um, defining what represent the collective. And in Barcelona, there's a large tradition of the, of the ground floor as a place of collective representation and gathering 
And it's precisely there where we use the most rich materials and we made the most effort in terms of the space composition, etc. And that's precisely what we did. Um, there's an auditorium, a small auditorium. So we tried to, to define a space that would blur the limits between the private and the public through actually very small gestures. Like for instance, it rains inside, this hall is open to the sky. So you enter, but still you're, it's raining. And this kind of small um, changes allow that ambiguity to happen. And after we did that, we nowadays we're building this building actually we're very happy that we are under construction and we, we we keep on working on the same it's like we're not changing radically we're kind of doing the same with uh, small changes and what does mean and this this is a social housing that we're also building in the outskirts of barcelona and and in this case as you see there's light changes um the typology shift instead of two bathrooms we have of a green room. It's a room that can um, enclose and open. So it's a semi-exterior, semi-interior external room um, that may engage with the outdoor. And then the radical change is just the door that it's placed at the edge, right? And, and you might consider that this is like, um, you, you know, not that relevant, but the way their spaces do relate are, it's way different. And it's something that we also did for this um, project in Aguascalientes that we did with a group of offices uh, led by Tatiana Bilbao. And, and in this project, for instance, as you see the typology is similar, but what we did was the door is placed at the corner and that allows this small change allows the connectivity not only in one direction, but in the, in the other direction as well. So the amount of ambiguity and flexibility among the spaces is larger. And, but again, we're still on working with the same idea of this kind of, not exactly the same room. There are similar rooms that do have slightly differences and that then the, pr the problem is not predetermined and you can always expand and decrease. In the case of Mexico, the size of the room was related to the construction type. So there are things, there are restrictions and constraints that do depend on how you build. Also, legally speaking, the law and the, the construction procedures. But again, we were working on the same, right? How to grow. And, and probably now at the office, we are in that state. How to, def to define a diffuse house? So at the house, which limits are and be worse. And uh, we did this installation way before the first housing block that I show you. And it was an installation for New York. Um, the curators asked us to design a villa, um, kind of a, a single house in the outskirts of Rome. And obviously we, we are get, like, we think that nowadays we should be thinking about other types um, due to environmental impact. And, but we wanted to be there because it was a gallery in New York. So we just came out with the way of doing it and answering to the commission. And at the time uh, we were, um, we decided to get um, a book of a German um, ordinary houses from the sixties. We cut out the rooms of that book and we just spilled them in a territory that was Rome, but not Rome in Italy, Rome in Canada. Um, and alongside this floor plan of the house, we built a model um, that was just an instruction of those rooms of one meter high. And as you can imagine, our will with this floor plan and the model was to raise ambiguity. So it's very difficult to say within looking to this floor plan where the house starts and ends. It's very difficult to say if we're talking about one house or a set of houses. It's very difficult also to determine which is the program that happens in each of those spaces. So we think that we have to think about collective house in that way, in a much more open-ended and ambiguous manner in order to embrace the complexity of the social structures that we do have. And, um, and that's why I have been researching now after Kitchell City about just what I call urban kitchens are kitchens that have emerged in the last decades as an answer to the late tardio capitalist that we're living in and as an answer to the, to the impact of the digital sphere. 
And those are kitchens that differ enormously from the cooperatives or co-living kitchens that were empowered during the 60s and during the second, uh, during the third industrial revolution. These kitchens do happen outside the collective house itself. They do happen in the urban sphere and they do happen, all of them connected in a network, in a metropolitan level. And I'm gonna explain the origin of one of them. And it just started in the late 70s, early 80s in Lima as a consequence of a set of social and economical crises in 1977 and 1978, there were two huge massive um, strikes um, that stopped the country. And as a politically respond, steadily the, um, um, citizens started to organize cooking parts in, a, in an improvised manner in front of the markets collecting leftovers, etc. cetera. Um, the cooking pots had to, oh yes, um, uh, communes had two uh, goals. First, obviously to fit the society that it was in crisis, the citizens, but also there were places of political um, engagement. And thanks to that, those actions, a set of women started to organize themselves in their neighborhoods, in their communities as a continuity of those collective uh, uh, temporal pots, cooking pots. And you see how this, you know, you see the relation between these acts of cooking uh, with um, the, the, the politics of the time, based on just the images that you can find is, you know, the cookers sit in front of the table with the cooking pot, but you know, you have this kind of political arrangement and with this political uh, slogans at the back or type, type of slogans at the back. And those of you that you don't know, Lima, Lima is definitely, is, is, is most of Lima is built on this hilly topographies and most of the kitchens are, the urban kitchens are placed in these topographies. And they are, all these neighborhoods have, um, were built mostly after the sixties, but, um, but um, most of them 70s, 80s, 90s. And they were built with these massive occupations um, so the kitchens also emerge with um, the um, the emerge of the city of Lima as we know it nowadays. So they are deeply rooted with the promotion of the construction of neighborhoods, um, and that's why they do have this political agenda uh, to the point. And it's very interesting because if you ask nowadays the cookers that do still participate in these kitchens, they would deny the political relation precisely because they have been used politically during these last decades. But it was one of the murders that was much impactful, socially speaking, was in 1992, when uh, Maria Elena Moyano was uh, murdered by the singing, Shining Path. And it was, you know, a very violent act that um, provoked a massive um, social protest and Marielena Moyano was not only a politician but also a leader of one of these kitchens. Uh, so it's clear their political uh, agenda and if you I'm gonna just roll on images. So those are images that I took in so they're nowadays um, their state of nowadays. Most of them they started to occupy former houses and but progressively they they started to occupy and just you know regular renting um, ground floors and progressively, um, some of them have grew and uh, have turned almost into a civic center scale building type. Um, but their operativity has remained. There are a group of 15 women, just women, it's a bit exclusive on that note, um, that they cook uh, in terms of three every three days. And they have been operative since the 80s. So, you know, like they are now 40 years old. So the new generation is taking over. And um, they initially they just cook for their families, but uh, very at the beginning they start to cook to the community. They sell their uh, menus for a very low price, which can um, allow them to um, pay the infrastructure. Uh, they don't receive a salary; they deny the salary because in Peru there's the, this culture that is called the minca culture. This very rooted. So for a feminist for a material feminist, for instance, or for a feminist of, or for a certain feminist um, um, 
paths, it would be like for us, like checking, oh no, uh, they should get paid for their work, right? We need to claim uh, that reproductive labor should be paid. But we need to remember that we, that each of us, we come from different territories with different cultures and different perspectives. So it's very Western to claim that um, they should be paid. Uh, we have to understand that um, the culture of the Minka that is very rooted is based on the idea of trade, but not necessarily economically economical trade. So for them to accept to be part of a wage, it means to accept to be part of a very extractive capitalist system. So they, 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 they just, just say no. Um, okay. And uh, I, I'm, I'm talking too much and realize about that. So I'm just gonna show you some maps also to, to realize about the numbers. Um, in, in, we, we are still counting, but in Lima, we have been able to count around 2,400. Just to give you a sense of size, New York and Lima could be compatible in terms of um, dense population. And in New York, we have 1,500 public schools. In Lima, there are 2,500 public uh, like urban kitchens. So that gives you a sense of, of the impact. And we started also mapping them. So you realize that you have one of these type of cooking infrastructure every few blocks, which means that they're used in a daily and regular basis. They're formed part of you know, the rituals of, of the ordinary life. And my interest to the, towards these kitchens, I, I end up working on three cities that they do have this type of kitchens. And the two ones that I'm gonna show very fast there have emerged in the last decade as a consequence of the 2000 crisis, as a consequence of the, digi of the impact of the, the digital technologies in the labor structures. One is Comedores Comunitarios in Mexico City. And it's um, a program that promoted the government to promote labor in Mexico City after 2008 economical crash. And it's a new typology of, of collective kitchens that do happen in houses mostly 80% of them. And, and it works, they work very, very similarly to the Lima case. The difference is that they are uh, connected by uh, this online network and um, regulated partially by the government. So it's a half private public system. And um, this is the map of them in 2017 when I visit. And it's very interesting to put them in parallel to a similar phenomenon that has happened in Tokyo after 2011 earthquake, but also kind of answering 2008 um, economic crisis. And in the case of Tokyo compared to Mexico, it's a bottom-up movement. So it started without the institutional help, the governmental help, it started as a, a, a grassroots movement and it's very liquid in its nature. These kitchens that they're called Kodomo kitchens because Kodomo, Kodomo means children in, 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 in Japanese and they are addressed mainly for the kids but most and most of them are run by the elderly but nowadays after these eight years of existence they are much open and diverse everyone can participate and they're liquid as i was mentioning because they occupy former spaces so you can see them in ithakayas you know the, the bar typology you can see them in bakeries you can see them happening wherever there's a space that allow them to happen and that happens thanks to the fact that they're they're connected through an online platform that allows that flexibility to happen. And probably I'm gonna stop talking now and allow questions. Um, but for me, if you take a look to the urban kitchens, they do relate with the idea of the diffuse house. They do relate with the need of starting dismantling how the, we understand our houses and starting dismantling and redefining really the productive labor in order to be way fairer <laughs> and in order to break down biases of, of gender but also race and many others. Thank you very much. Thank you Anna for the nice talk. I know that there are some questions uh, already prepared from some of the students. Anna, you mentioned having a question. Hello Anna, nice to see you. Mm. Oh, yeah. Anna, for... Anna, meet Anna. 
Yes. <laughs> nice to see you. Hello. Hola. Good to see you again. Thank you for the for the inspiring lecture. Uh, it was really, really nice. Um, so I really like the moment in which you compare the 19th century plan with your recent project in, in Barcelona, somehow reminding us that the concept of flexibility has been present in architecture for years, even if we talk about it as something contemporary. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the about your position towards the concept of sharing economy. I perceived in the beginning of the lecture that, that you were a bit skeptical uh, with it. I don't know, could you elaborate a bit more on your position, your why? Because it's maybe a product of nowadays. Why, why are you so like critical with it? Um, yeah, I'm very critical because <laughs> Uh, at the beginning, you know, like when I started researching about all these topics, I used to claim, you know, collectivity no, it doesn't mean, um, as I was lightly referring at today, it doesn't mean to be part of an idea. Like a collect collective architecture doesn't mean uh, to be one type of ideology. It can be appropriated by many. This is something that, I, I mean, it's not me saying it. Uh, we, have, we can... Aldo Rossi said that, you know, it's like, it's like many others said it. Um, so our architecture can be politicized, right? And, and at this point, I think it's stupid to say it because we have seen how the share economy, which started with um, um, a certain ideology of uh, sharing resources to reduce uh, environmental impact and to assure social equity, etc., was very fast in the last ten years uh, engulfed by 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 capitalism itself. So you, we have these huge companies that are, that are um, uh, extremely extractivist in the way they operate um, and uh, using na a narrative that it's totally, you know. <laughs> Um, that it, it's it's totally opposite. Um, so, so I think that we're living in a time that we have to be very aware of of um, that we can be neutralized very easily, and in and and we have to make sure that uh, we find spots and and spaces of resistance of of those um, extractivist architectures and procedures like um, and there's a huge um, debate in Barcelona nowadays about dark kitchens right these kitchens that do cook for many neighbors they don't want them and suddenly this kind of um, uh, cooking infrastructures are like the evil right and I, I'm I, I'm trying to communicate that to have a, a huge collective kitchen that might operate might be operated by a company it's not negative per se what is negative is if when it doesn't relate with its context it doesn't respond to the neighbors it doesn't support the social welfare of the neighborhood so it would be fantastic if we think about these dark kitchens as a support of their neighborhood it would be fantastic to consider that this food could be supplied and very, very sustain by very sustainable means, you know, just walking across the street to the neighbors around and support, you know, their daily life and activity. Uh, else, we could talk about economical resources, etc. So, uh, so the problem is that how these um, companies that are collectivized, and by that collective, I mean working for a large group of people are operating nowadays, like the reproductive labor resources, right? Um, what means cooking, what means cleaning, what it's... And, and ultimately, all these works have been out of the regulation, as I was saying, because it's a, it's a radical tool of seclusion, not only architecturally speaking, like, you know, if you enclose that in, within walls, then it's going to be excluded. But also, if you put them out of the regulated system, the people that do operate and work for that, lacks of right of, you know, social rights, health rights, uh, even voting. And we see that now with the pandemic, like in New York, most of the workers that are first, you know, line from workers are unregulated citizens. And suddenly they cannot get the vaccine, but are the ones that should get the vaccine, right? So there's a lot of, so this type of work has been always out unregulated, for purpose, because then you know it's uh, cheaper. It's um, 
what I'm saying is that if we think about urban infrastructures of domestic labor, we can think about them to, in order to regulate a little bit um, all this. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Yes. Uh, Maria? You are on mute. Sorry. Uh, so on that on that sense, maybe it's not a question, but more of a of a remark. But uh, thank you very much for the lecture. It was really interesting. I mean, uh, we're also uh, working on our thesis uh, in uh, on on food, so it is it is really insightful. Um, so uh, I was I was really interested in in those urban uh, kitchens you you mentioned uh, in the end not only in Lima, but also for the, the, this platform in Tokyo. So a question would be if you could elaborate more on, on, on how this, this platform would operate in those izakayas and how uh, these events uh, could take place. Um, and then it, it also reminded me of um, when, when, uh, when I was in Portugal, I was, I was in Lisbon visiting and then there were these restaurants that were these secret restaurants, but uh, I don't know if you are aware of them, but you could go and have uh, Chinese food in, in a real uh, home of, of, of Chinese people that would live there. And it would be illegal to do so. And you would have to search a lot in order uh, to go and eat there. And uh, instead of this uh, collective uh, thing, it would be actually more expensive than if you would go to an actual Chinese restaurant there. But also at the same time, super interesting. Even the bathroom of the place was these people's bathroom, and uh, the mom would cook, and you would have the food at your table. Um, that's a very interesting case. I didn't know about it. Um, obviously, that's why I think we have to think about the relation of architecture and the digital platforms and the digital sphere because it has its good and bad point, right? As we're like the sharing economy and emerge thanks to this hyper-connectivity. But also we have all these initiatives that um, allow um, suddenly, as I was referring before, a spaces of resistance. And maybe, I don't know about this case in Lisbon, but um, uh, I have been uh, researching this year for the Istanbul Biennial about Cairo. And, and, uh, and it was very interesting uh, because I had all, I assume a lot of everything wrongly, I would say. <laughs> so again, with my Western perspective, <laughs> I arrived there, start interviewing, and I realized that. Um, so in, in, in Cairo, there's a huge platform called MAM that connects women that cook from home, right? And I approach um, that reality because I found it, that it's growing enormously, and I found it fascinating. And I discovered that um, that is an old habit um, that has grew enormously with internet, but not through this platform, but you know, like there's a lot of women selling not only food, everything from home. And that's thanks to Facebook, thanks to Instagram, thanks to other social platforms. And what is interesting is that for them, for the first time before, it's not that that didn't happen, that happened. But that happened within their community. And obviously, within a community, community, we always think of good community, like good po community positive. No? Uh, but not necessarily, sometimes community relations are very biased. So for a lot of women also to, to have access to digital platforms meant um, a lot of freedom, to have access to other um, realities, other communities, other structures that went beyond their own community. And thanks to that, uh, most of them grew enormously there to the point that there's a fantastic story about a woman that wanted divorce. And, you know, in, in Cairo, it's extremely difficult. And it's, well, not in Egypt, but, you know, extremely difficult to get divorced and extremely expensive. So she needed money. So she started to sell cookies that she could, you know, bake once in a while in their kitchen. And she got so famous that she turned all her house into an industrial factory and ended up hiring most of 
um, a lot of people from her, their community to the end. She could get, well, not only she could get divorced, but actually, you know, you can imagine to turn your house into an industry, it's quite something, right? Um, what I'm saying here, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much again, is that you can still find basis of resistance uh, thanks to the openness of internet. So internet has its bad points and its good points, and it's just a tool and it depends how we use it. And in the case of uh, Cairo, it meant to empower a lot of uh, women that lack of access to other type of labor um, outside their homes. And, and progressively, what it's my wish, and I hope uh, that these platforms would achieve regulation because one is one of the question marks, okay? Like if, uh, yeah, they, they, are, they are empowered, they are turning their homes into productive spaces, not for reproductive labor, but other type of productions. And that, uh, that, uh, that, that is allowing them visibility as in Lima, and therefore it means empowered men and social rights, but you need to achieve them. And you need to have access to the rights, right? Like legal <laughs> rights. Legal access. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Is there another question? Yes, I Michael? have another question. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, I actually have two questions. One is pr probably very simple. Uh, early on in the presentation, there was a floor plan with an, uh, an image of a floor plan with a contour of a key superimposed on it. And I was curious what that is. And the other question, um, is um, I, I found it extremely nice or extremely inspiring to see and hear from someone to able to be able to productively juggle over multiple time zones, theory and practice, designing and researching and teaching and learning in a way, right? So maybe could you share some um, insights on how your daily routine looks like or how you balance all these uh, uh, activities? Um, we're here to learn. <laughs> Look, uh, architecture is collective uh, and it's something that we have, at least when I studied architecture, I, uh, most of our references were just single names, right? And, you know, like Alvar Alto and I don't know, and most of them white male. But, you know, like then uh, you realize that that's actually an imaginary that has an ideology behind and an ideology of this figure that will present a complex world and it's oversimplified in order to be super simplified, communicated, etc. Uh, and it's a way of commodifying architecture in a way. Uh, you know, you, we become products as architects like you and we have seen that in with the star architect, right? Um, but um, architecture is collective. So I do what I do, but it's not just I do it by myself. Um, I, the office, we are, uh, we like to think that we are an horizontal structure. So I do participate in projects, not in others. And we restructure working teams depending on, on the type of work and our um, availability. And, and at the, I, I was first a researcher that being, a, that having an office, I didn't want to have an office in the late 2000s because every, it was like it, before 2008, it was insane in Spain. There was so much going on, so much construction. I felt, I, I started in an office, working in an office and I felt very stupid and, you know, very, I don't know, I didn't like it. So at the time, nobody wanted to teach. So I ended up teaching when I was 25 years old because really nobody wanted to teach in 2000 in Spain. There was so much, so nice work going on, like construction speaking. And, and then when the crisis hit, um, I felt that it was a very interesting moment to go back and, uh, and to think about the practice. And, and then there was no work as you can imagine. And, and then, you know, collective, um, um, you need collective support when there's no work. You need, uh, on practical terms, you need to share expenses. You need to share responsibility. You cannot afford to do it by yourself. And naturally speaking, also, it's, it's way cooler. You are so lost in the middle of a crisis that you want to, you know, talk with others and share and think about, you know, what we do, right? So, um, so it was both practical and both with the will of the kind of mental necessity to have people to talk with. Um, so that's how I emerge. And, uh, and I feel like we are new, gen 
I, th I feel like the, the discipline is changing for good. We are a generation that that we understand the complexity of the profession, and it's it would be very stupid for me to claim, for instance, that you know I'm the one designing you know, one means design for the <laughs> for first place, you know, and and like everything is done in a through a conversation with people, and then you always have to understand what you can put on the table. So I. I'm the one putting the research, you know, and, and that's it. Great, thank you. Great answer. Thank you. <clears throat> and then there was still this, the, the open question of the, 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 the floor plan with a key uh, drawn on top of it. What was that about? The floor plan of the key basically is that it's very visually to understand that you have a head and the head is a space of the family and that's, and you know, you take the key from the head. You know, the head is like the most important thing. And and it's a bit ridiculous if you think about it. Like, why the bedroom is not the most important thing? You know, it's it's a it's a special construction that influences us to think that the proper place needs to be the living room. It needs to be tidied up. It needs to be the place where we all meet, uh, because you want to reinforce the idea of family meeting, and not individuality, right? And that's a cultural construction. Um, I don't think that there's good things or bad things. My, my, what I think is problematic is when we just have one cultural, like one type. That, 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 I think that that's what is problematic within a society. Thank you, Anna. I, I would just like to ask maybe Ella or Louise have a final question for Anna before we... Um... Yes, first of all, Anna, thank you so much for your great lecture. It was brilliant and very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Maybe just uh, as we are getting closer to dinner time, can you, uh, uh, I just want to ask you about your, your house. Do you have a kitchen in your place? How do you handle this question on a personal level after studying it through history? Wow, that's a very. <laughs> uh, I love cooking. I I'm one of. I have my kitchen is very small. Um, you know the IKEA uh, tabletops that are to, like prefab IKEA, uh, one meter width. So I just have two two of those, and everything is movable. So I just have one pot, one pan. You know, I cannot have too many things, and that forces you. I have like a minimum kitchen. I eat a fridge. And kind of like it, kind of, I mean, maybe I, I don't deny that maybe I would change through time because, you know, like I was reading again Foucault the other day and he finishes a book with saying, okay, burn this book. Like he always claimed that burn this book after reading it, right? Like ideas need to change because um, orders and he it was, is this book about the orders and, um, you know, we need to change because context change. So our opinions also need to evolve and change. So I might change my opinion, but until now I like to live with few things because it forces you to select. And it forces you also, when you have a small fridge, it forces you to buy more often. Uh, so I have a lot of relations with all my neighbors and all the stores around because I have to go there almost in a daily basis. I don't have a space to store and and that helps you know then I have much more social life because of my kitchen is very small um I have always had the wish to set up a collective kitchen in, my, in the office but I'm not convincing the team let's say um but I, one day I probably would achieve it I would find it fantastic and, and by that I mean a urban kitchen not a collective for us but you know for the neighborhood um but I think it probably in the coming years, if I can achieve it. Um, there are a lot of things in relation with the law that makes it very difficult also. Great, well, thank you again yeah. for uh, the great lecture and contributing to the masterclass in this way. Uh, on behalf of everybody, we thank you. Maybe a round of applause if everybody can take, you know, on silent, thank you. Um,